Hi, I'm Mike Cowell. I'm the director of the Business Innovation Zone. The Business Innovation Zone, or the Biz, was created to help high growth potential entrepreneurs and businesses in central Iowa. We provide a variety of services, including mentoring, consulting, counseling, validating business models, and help with access to funding for high growth companies. We offer also a number of networking opportunities, including luncheons uh, once a month and all day seminars on subjects such as marketing and finance. You can find out more about the biz at www.bizci.org. Thank you. Um, I'm Emily Harris. I am an intellectual property attorney at the Davis Brown Law Firm. Um, I'm a registered patent attorney. Uh, I practice in also in trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, anything that touches on intellectual property, license agreements. Um, I'm a little bit of background about me. I'm from uh, the Des Moines area. I graduated from Hoover High School. Um, I went to Grinnell College where I majored in molecular biology. Um, I worked at Pioneer Hybrid in a lab for several years. Uh, moved to Chicago, worked at Northwestern University Medical School um, in research. Uh, had enough with dealing with little research mice. Decided I'd go try something different, went back to law school um, at the University of Iowa. Um, after law school, I joined the Davis firm and have been there ever since. Um, I'm a registered patent attorney, which means I've taken both the uh, state bar and a separate bar that patent uh, people have to take in order to be uh, able to practice in front of the patent office. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the various types of intellectual property um, and how to protect them. I'm going to focus on trademarks, but I've got a little bit of information about patents and copyrights uh, too. So why should a uh, startup company care about intellectual property? Two main reasons. The defensive reason, um, you want to make sure that uh, someone else's registered intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, aren't going to prevent you from carrying out your business. You don't want to have to change what you're doing because someone else um, has protection that will prevent you from doing it. You don't want to get sued. Then there's offensive reasons. It provides you a competitive advantage. You can prevent others from using your intellectual property. It provides you a marketing advantage. Uh, you can use that circle R designation if you have a registered trademark and mark things with uh, your patent number. It increases the value of your business um, and it might actually provide you with a stream of revenue. There are four main types of intellectual property protection. Trademarks, which are words or symbols or other devices that identify the source of goods or services. Uh, there's patents and patents give you the right to prevent others from making, using, or selling your inventions. Copyrights, they protect original works of authorship, and that includes software. And then trade secrets, which are confidential secret information, like customer lists, recipes, formulas, that provide a competitive advantage to your company. Here's an example of intellectual property protection for uh, one product, and there's, it's covered by all four different types of intellectual property. The Hershey's Kisses, the trademark protects the shape of the candy. There's patent protection for a method of reducing fat levels in the cocoa that they put in the candy. They have copyright protection for commercials, advertisement, and then there's trade secret protection for the recipe formula for making the candy. So we're going to start with trademarks. What is a trademark? A trademark identifies goods and services coming from a single source. They establish goodwill with the consumer. They're a way that consumers can distinguish each merchant's goods or services. In short, trademarks equal reputation. I'm going to go through trademark law kind of in terms of misconceptions that I hear um, from clients all the time. And so I've got 10 of them. The misconception number 10, a trademark has to be a name or a logo. Here's easily recognized trademark. There's a word mark, Coca-Cola. You see it and you know exactly where it came from. It distinguishes it from other uh, soft drinks like Pepsi. There's all kinds of word marks you encounter everywhere. Uh, McDonald's, Merrill Lynch, Enron, they all bring to mind what the products or services are, whether that's good or bad. Here's a whole screen of, of designs. Um, they don't have any word marks on them, and I bet most everyone can pick out most of these just from the 
the logos that are affiliated with them. You've got Adidas and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell, Kmart, Nike, Domino's, NBC. Just a design alone can convey to the consumer who you are, that it's your product. Color can actually be a trademark completely by itself. Uh, the green on the far side of the screen is, that's John Deere green. The middle is Tiffany blue. This side is Owen Corning pink. And so you can register color alone uh, so that people see your color and know that it's your product. Sound can also be a trademark. Examples of sound marks include the NBC, NBC chimes. The roar of the Harley Davidson motorcycle engine is actually trademarked. The MGM lion's roar is protected and Intel's Pentium processor, uh, the sounds that, that they advertise that with, is protected as a trademark. There's another type of trademark, this is called trade dress, where you can identify the source of the product just by looking at the shape, packaging, uh, the look of it. So can you identify the source of this product? That's a Coke bottle. How did you know the source? It's trade dress, which is a type of trademark. Examples of trade dress, you can anything you can think of that is the overall look of, of something, packaging, a building, so we've got the Coke bottle, Mrs. Butterworth, the shape of the bottle. The iPod is actually the trade dress, so the shape of the iPod is protected. And then uh, the appearance of um, IHOP, the building, all of those are used as trademarks. Trademark misconception number nine, the more the mark conveys about the nature of the product or services, the better it is. Trademarks vary in strength according to a spectrum, and the strongest marks are the easiest ones to protect and defend. The weakest marks are very difficult to protect and possibly impossible to protect. Here's the spectrum. So we've got generic, descriptive, suggested, suggestive, and arbitrary marks. Examples of generic marks are baking soda, telephone, restaurant, and those wouldn't be entitled to trademark protection at all. You can't prevent others from using generic terms. Weak marks, they're descriptive. You see the mark and you know what it is that the product or the services that are affiliated with it. So <coughs> Iowa Lottery, uh, Vision Center, uh, Comfort Inn, those are all examples of descriptive marks. Suggestive marks, uh, Word Perfect, Copper Tone, Jaguar, you look at them and you don't know exactly what the product is, but the uh, mark itself suggests it, or certain qualities of the product. Um, and then the strongest marks are your arbitrary marks like Apple computers, um, Arrow for shirts, and Kodak. The best trademark is the one that bears no relationship to the, to the goods or services that go with it. From a, this is from a trademark attorney point of view. They're much easier to protect. They're easier to defend. When you're selecting a mark, oftentimes it's best to to go towards the suggestive and the uh, arbitrary, fanciful side of things. Uh, misconception number eight, a trademark can be reserved indefinitely. So, you know, I'll get a call from a client who has 10 trademarks that they think they might want to use at some point in time, and they want me to register them so that they can keep them for their use far into the future. And they're not really sure that they're actually ever going to use those. Trademark protection does not actually exist until you use the mark, so you, you don't have a trademark until you've used the mark in commerce with the goods or services. You can file a limited time reservation of a mark with uh, the federal government, a federal intent to use application. If you don't use it within the limited amount of time uh, and file uh, documents showing the trademark office that you are appropriately using it in commerce, then the application will be denied. So you, you don't have any rights in that mark. Misconception number seven, I get this one a lot. I registered my name with the Secretary of State, so therefore I own the trademark and I can prevent others from using it, right? No, because trademark rights uh, accrue with use, reservation of a business name which is not considered any sort of use in commerce, does not by itself confer any trademark rights. Um, use in commerce is the only way that you can acquire those type of rights. Packaging, putting it on a package, advertising, promotional activities, having it on the, the 
page of your website, not just in the domain, getting it out there so that consumers come to recognize it as a trademark. I also will have people say, you know, I looked at the Secretary of State, their corporate filing records, and I didn't see my uh, mark, so therefore I can use it. It's mine. It's available. The same way that um, I talked about before, it's, it doesn't tell you about trademark use at all. I mean, a, what you file as the Secretary of State is a, a trade name, your business name, which you may not be actually using with your product or your services in commerce in any way. So it doesn't tell you anything about whether someone else could prevent you from using the mark. This is a kind of a similar misconception, number six. I reserved a domain name, so I own the trademark. So, you know, a company starting a new business uh, picks a trademark and then reserves the domain name. They immediately put page under construction on the website with no information about what their services or goods are. They're not using the mark in any other way, so they aren't selling it in stores, they're not promoting it, they don't have you know, business cards stationary with the mark on it uh, that they're getting out there. Another individual subsequently starts selling a similar product using the same name, and he's actually selling it. So he's got it on packaging, he's out there using it in commerce. The domain name owner calls me and says, I want you to stop this subsequent user from using my trademark and you know the question is can he stop that and the answer is probably not because trademark rights begin with use the the second comer the subsequent user who actually was using it in commerce probably has superior rights to the mark um, and the website owner is kind of out of luck owning a trademark does not necessarily mean that you have the right you're guaranteed the right to the domain name for your trademark if the domain name's already taken by someone else, you'd have to prove that that person took the domain, bought the domain in bad faith, or else the trademark owner is not likely able to be able to, to get that domain name transferred to them. Um, misconception number five, I've registered my trademark, so now I own it for any type of goods or services. When you file a trademark application, uh, a federal trademark application, you have to describe your mark, define your mark, and then you have to specifically state what goods or services uh, you're going to use with the mark. The rights conferred by that federal registration only extend to the specific goods or services that you use with the mark that you, that you declared with the mark. So others can adopt the identical mark in different areas for different goods or different <coughs> services some examples of two different companies that use the same mark, Dove Soap and Dove Chocolate, and Delta Airlines, Delta Dental. Those are all acceptable uses of those trademarks. Uh, misconception number four, uh, trademark infringement requires <coughs> my mark to be identical to someone else's mark. Trademark infringement is based on a standard called likelihood of confusion, and so it's you consider whether two marks are likely to be consumed or confused by the consumers. Some factors you consider when you determine whether two marks are likely to be confused include the similarity between the two marks, so how close are they to each other, uh, the similarity between the goods and services, because like I said, you can have completely different services and an identical mark, and those aren't likely to be confused. Uh, the strength of the marks, are the marks suggestive, descriptive, generic, evidence of actual confusion, and the channels of trade. So who buys the products that you're using your marks with, and where do they buy them? So are consumers going to encounter your mark and the other mark in the same place, um, and are they the same people that would buy the products? Marks that are similar but not identical can be found to infringe. You have to consider whether the marks are similar in sight, sound, and meaning. Changing one letter does not avoid infringement, and misspelling a word also does not avoid infringement. Here's some examples of marks that have been found likely to be confused. Arrow and arrow, they obviously don't look the same, but they sound the same. Aveda and Avita, beware and beware, cat track, cat track, and so on. Adding a number in instead of writing out the whole word doesn't um, avoid infringement. Misconception number three, 
I searched the trademark office website and I didn't find my mark, so the mark's available for me to use. The trademark office has a search engine called TESS uh, that allows you to search for trademarks, owners of trademarks, different goods and services. What the search engine does is it tells you whether a mark is not available. So if you search for a mark and you find someone else has a registration, you would know that the mark is not available for you to use. But it doesn't really tell you anything about what is actually available. Here's an example. You've got a new business owner who's making tires, has a new, wants to brand a new kind of tire. They develop the mark Mud Monster for their tire. They go to the trademark office website, use tests and do a search, um, and find that Mud Monster has been registered with um, this registration number. So therefore, the business owner knows that they cannot use Mud Monster for tires, and they need to go back to the drawing board. So they go back, and they come up with a new mark called Road Venture. And so they go to TESS again and do a search. No results are found in that test search. Is that mark available for their use? Not necessarily. Um, that test search is only going to find identical marks. And unless you have been trained in different ways to search TESS, TESS will miss uh, phonetic variations, misspellings, marks that are pronounced similarly but are not identical. So you would miss those marks that, are, that might be likely to be confused with your mark. Um, they wouldn't show up in the search. Also, because trademark rights inure from use um, and registration is not required, so you know, anyone anywhere could be using the mark and not filed a registration. So there very well could be users uh, with rights at common law that are out there using the mark they won't appear at all in the test search, and so uh, their rights could be superior to yours if you adopted the mark. So the only way to sort of get full clearance is what we call a full availability search, uh, where a company will, uh, an experienced trademark searching company will search the federal registration records, state registration records, the internet, common law uses, and typically then an attorney will look through those results and write an opinion telling you whether or not it appears that you can adopt that mark as your own. So, so uh, you could have somebody down the street who adopts, we'll use the Road Venture trademark. They're you know, in Des Moines, Iowa selling Road Venture um, tires. And the test uh, website search engine will not pick that up because it only picks up federal registrations. And if they have not filed a registration, filed for a registration, then it's not in their database. So they're using it as a trademark. They have trademark rights. They're called common law trademark rights because they don't have a registration. And if they adopted it first and have been using it in commerce as a trademark and you want to subsequently adopt it and use it for the same thing, then you would not be able to do that, they could prevent you from doing that because they are a prior user. TESS and the, and the U.S. Trademark Office, they only deal with U.S. Uh, trademarks. If you need protection abroad, anywhere else in the world, you have to file individually in individual countries um, to get uh, rights in those countries. Trademark law is certainly not um, black or white, black and white, so it comes down to uh, you know, a lot of it's very subjective. Do they look the same? Do they sound the same? Um, uh, you fall into the same thing when you've got logos instead of words. You know, do the pictures look the same? Um, what what message does it convey to the consumer? Um, so you know, it's certainly it's something that is not easy to dispute, and people fight over it for a long time. The records of the trademark office that test search also will tell you whether or not the registration is uh, live or dead. Uh, live registrations mean that it's in effect, it's in force, uh, there is someone that owns that mark. One, marks that have gone abandoned, you know, fees weren't paid or someone else canceled the mark, um, they're listed as dead. And so, uh, you know, as another example, like the road venture mark, say you found road venture but the registration was listed as dead. Uh, 
question whether the mark is available for you to use. Again, not necessarily because the road venture company could be using it still and had the mark canceled or didn't pay fees or something and it went abandoned and is listed as dead. So um, <coughs> without doing a complete search of uh, common law uses, state registrations, state use, then um, you don't really know what else is out there. Misconception number two, trademark clearance is not necessary. Work with a lot of startup companies who are excited to get going. They've got what they think is a great brand. Uh, they start using it, go out there, and they're advertising, marketing. Um, and they didn't consider the consequences of what might happen without checking to make sure that that trademark was available for them to use. Here's a local example. Um, it was in the newspapers. Uh, T-shirt store, store Smash had to change its name to Raygun after they got a cease and desist letter from a California company who had rights to the trademark. Um, the owner was quoted in the paper as saying the company spent $25,000 on rebranding uh, signage and, and uh, changing over to the Raygun name. That didn't include any of the money that they spent originally on Smash. <coughs> Um, possible consequences of not knowing what's out there. Um, that prior user can force you to rebrand. Um, you have to change your signs, business cards, stationery, advertising. Um, you have the potential to lose your customers because they don't know that you're changing names or they, don't, they get confused. Um, and there could be a lawsuit. If there is a lawsuit, uh, damages could include um, an injunction which would require you to rename um, you'd have to give up profits earned by the use of that trademark um, and then other damages including punitive damages and attorney's fees. An example of this is uh, Payless versus Adidas. Payless shoe store came out with shoes that had three stripes on them that were found to infringe the Adidas registered trademark for the three stripe shoes. The uh, damage award that included the profits uh, punitive damages and attorney's fees was $304 million. Misconception number one, there's no need to register my mark. There's many benefits to having a federal trademark registration. Um, it protects your ability to expand. So that federal trademark would uh, allow a company in Iowa um, who you know, does business solely in Iowa and Minnesota, it protects their ability to expand anywhere in the country. Your registration may prevent others who actually are doing their homework from adopting confusingly similar marks. Uh, so it might head off a lawsuit um, or a conflict with another company. Uh, your registration serves as a notice. Just the fact that it's registered is actual notice um, of your mark to others. And so it cuts against their argument that they adopted it in good faith if you end up in a lawsuit. Um, you can use that Circle R designation only when you register your trademark, which confers a marketing benefit. Uh, you have access to federal court, which gives you the ability to collect trouble damages and attorney fees if you end up in a lawsuit. That US registration can serve as the basis for foreign trademark registrations, so you can claim your use in the US as priority for use abroad. And then federal trademark registrations can significantly increase the value of your company. Uh, the registration process is relatively simple for a federal trademark application. Uh, it's typically all done electronically. Um, the trademark office has a website that's fairly easy to use. An application is pr prepared, submitted to the trademark office. Uh, once it gets there, it's assigned to uh, an examining attorney uh, that uh, attorney will conduct research uh, searching other marks of the marks that are alive and are registered with the Federal Trademark Office. So they don't search any common law uses, state uses, anything. They just search federal records um, to decide if your trademark is confusingly similar to any existing registered trademarks. They also consider whether there are other issues, like is your mark generic or descriptive, and if it is, they'll reject your application based on that. If no other marks are found and there are no other issues, then it's published in the official gazette. Once it's published, there's 30 days for any member of the public to 
complain that they think that your proposed trademark is too close to theirs. If no opposition is filed, then if the application was filed for a mark already used in commerce, it proceeds to registration. You get your registration certificate. An intent to use application, which is the kind of application where you have picked a mark, haven't started using it yet, but <coughs> intend to use it um, eventually, will require what's called a statement of use, which is um, typically a declaration and photograph showing that you have started using your mark in commerce. Um, you have to do that before the registration is complete. Um, once it's registered, you have to maintain your mark by filing affidavits and renewals. And as long as you're using it and paying the uh, renewal fees, then your trademark can continue indefinitely. It's generally recommended that an attorney file and prosecute um, trademark applications, do searches, and prepare opinions about trademark availability. Like Mike was saying, it, it um, adds credibility to your company and it makes it somewhat easier if you're trying to sell it or value your, it, it increases the value of your company. I just have a very brief overview of patents. Um, patents aren't necessarily applicable to every uh, new business. Quick patent primer, what can be patented? Uh, the US Supreme Court has said anything contemplated by the mind of man can be patented. Uh, there are three main conditions for patentability, and this is sort of patent lawyer speak. They have to be new, useful, and what's called non-obvious. Useful, more or less anything meets that requirement. If you can do something with it, then it's useful. New, as long as there's not something identical to your invention out there, it generally meets the new threshold. Non-obviousness is tricky. Um, it's a subjective determination about whether one of it's what's called one of ordinary skill in the art would look at what else is out there and think that it would be obvious to make your invention. I've got several just general tips about patents. The US has a first to invent system. So that means that you, it's not a race to the patent office. It, it doesn't matter if person A invents it <coughs> one day and person B invents it two years later, but person B beats them to the patent office, person B is not going to have rights to that patent. It's going to be person A. Because of our first to invent system, we've got this rule that says that you cannot disclose, sell, publish anything about your invention uh, more than one year before you file the patent application. Because of that, you should always, always, always use a non-disclosure agreement if you're talking about your invention before you filed a patent application. There are two types of, of um, patent applications for um, products, processes, provisional and utility. A provisional patent application is a kind of quick patent application that you get on file uh, usually because you've got a disclosure coming up, you're going to talk about it with somebody, you've got a paper that's being published. Um, and you want to make sure you get your patent application filed before you do that. Uh, the provisional application buys you a year of time. It just sits at the patent office. It's not considered. It will never issue. Um, it just holds your, your date that you filed if you're up against a deadline. You've got one year, and then you have to file a regular application. It's called a utility application. That's the application that goes through the patent process. Everywhere else in the world, or most everywhere else in the world, has a um, different system. They don't have that one year uh, grace period. And so if there's any chance that you have an invention that you think you want to seek patent protection for in a foreign country, do not disclose it, describe it, publish it, sell it uh, before you file a patent application, whether that's a US application or um, applications in foreign countries. Because if you do do any of those things, uh, before an application is filed, you won't be able to get a patent in any, foreign, any of those foreign countries that have that system. Kind of a new event in patent law, software patents have been the subject matter of much debate, whether or not um, they're called business method patents. Uh, business method patents are actually valid, eligible subject matter. Back in June, the US Supreme Court did decide that uh, business methods are eligible for uh, patent protection. Here's some examples of business method patents. You've got um, Amazon.com has their one-click patent where a customer can complete an online application or an online order form without or with just a single mouse click. 
they successfully prevented Barnes & Noble from in implementing this uh, similar system. Uh, Priceline has patents for their reverse auction uh, system. Uh, there's prepaid cellular service patents, and there are patents directed uh, business methods, you name them, people have filed patent applications for them. There are patents directed to market, conducting market research and uh, focus groups. Apple has filed patent applications that recently became public. Um, these are not yet issued uh, on mobile applications. So it's just an example of the wide variety of things that you can file patent applications for. A quick overview of the patent process. Patent application is prepared. Patent application will include what's called the specification, which is a description of your invention drawings and then claims, and they're filed. that's filed with the U.S. Patent Office. Um, it's assigned to a patent examiner who does a search for prior art. The examiner then issues what's called an office action, which describes whatever problems that examiner has identified um, with your application and the prior art. So usually there's um, uh, rejections based on uh, something's not, they don't think that your invention is new or non-obvious. Uh, the applicant will then respond to the office action to try and persuade the examiner to issue the patent. Um, there's always a possibility of more office actions. This exchange occurs um, repeatedly and eventually, hopefully, the outcome is that the examiner and the applicant agree on allowable subject matter. Um, the examiner will allow the patent and it will issue. Uh, the patent is going to be valid for 20 years from that first filing date. Um, you cannot file a, refile a patent that has expired and you can't get extensions to your 20 years. Um, you also must pay maintenance fees over the course of that 20 year life of the patent in order to keep it in force. Copyrights protect original works of authorship fixed in a uh, tangible media, which means uh, literary works, which includes software, musical works, dramatic works, sculpture, general artworks, sound recordings, architectural works. Copyrights for software, they protect the source code and they can protect the appearance of your, your program. Um, they don't protect function. That's where you have to switch over to get patent protection. It's not required to register a copyright. You own a copyright as soon as you create a work. You can register it with the Federal Copyright Office, which will convey certain benefits. Registration is simple. Uh, you fill out a form and provide a deposit, which is a copy of your work. Copyright infringement, here's just kind of a general description of penalties for copyright infringement. Actual damages, uh, attorney's fees, injunction. The court can impound the illegal works and the infringer can actually go to jail. And that's it. <laughs>